All right, well, I guess we can introduce ourselves to get started. So I'm Caitlin, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a social worker and the program and outreach coordinator at Sheena's Place. And I'm over here on jack.org's account hosting us. <laughs> yeah, and I'm Steve, I use he, him pronouns, and I run the marketing communications and registration at Sheena's Place. And I'm joining from the Sheena's Place account. Awesome. So we uh, thank you all so much for submitting questions. Um, we received a lot of really great ones. There were some overlaps. So we've taken a look and tried our best to consolidate some of the answers. Um, but please keep asking questions uh, in the comments here. We'll do our best to answer what we can uh, in the time that we have. Um, and if there's, yeah, if there's anything coming up, any like clarifying questions or anything that's confusing, let us know as well. Um, and yeah, we're really, just really happy to be here. Mm -hmm. So Super we thought, oh, sorry, Steve. <laughs> no, that's okay. Continue. Okay, so we thought we'd start. Um, we had kind of two categories of questions that came up. Um, the first was just around like eating disorder basics, um, how to support someone, how to identify an eating disorder. And then the other questions were more about Sheena's Place and the services we offer and what's available. So. We'll start with the more general eating disorder stuff and then move into our uh, services. So just really broadly speaking to start for anyone who maybe is, uh, has heard the term eating disorder before, but maybe not so clear on what that actually means. Uh, an eating disorder is essentially a classification of a mental illness or a mental health challenge um, that involves a relationship with food or the body that's harmful to physical and mental health. So that encompasses a lot. I know not everyone identifies with the language of disorder. Um, often we'll see symptoms pop up as actually very normal reactions to more disordered or problematic situations. So um, know that we're using that language, but we acknowledge that it doesn't resonate with everyone. Um, as well, you know, eating disorders occur on a spectrum. So people may experience symptoms, which we will refer to as disordered eating. And um, they might not have a diagnosis, but everyone, regardless where they are on the spectrum, is equally as deserving of support and treatment. So you don't need a diagnosis to um, be struggling or to be worthy of that support. So we just want to preface by saying that. Um, we got a question around, you know, how do eating disorders start? Like, why do they even develop? Um, the answer, you know, for each of these questions, we could talk for a while. So we'll give a kind of brief overview. Um, eating disorders essentially arise out of a combination of biological, uh, social, cultural, and psychological factors. So someone might have a genetic predisposition to an eating disorder. There is quite a strong genetic correlate. Um, and then they will be faced with various situations in their environment, in their life that will trigger the onset of symptoms. So, um, for example, some of these social or cultural factors include the environment that someone grows up in, the messages they get from family, from friends about bodies, about food while they're growing up, as well as societal beauty standards, um, social media. We live in a culture of, you know, constant comparisons. Um, and discrimination and depression as well. So things like uh, racism and shadism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, fat phobia, ableism, all of these things um, impact a person's likelihood of developing an eating disorder. Um, and then other psychological factors like other mental health challenges, depression, anxiety, uh, experiencing trauma, and um, emotion regulation more broadly. So all of these factors kind of can combine in, in many different ways. Um, and another major risk factor is food restriction. So whether that's intentional through dieting or unintentional through food insecurity, that would make someone more likely to develop an eating disorder as well. Um, usually eating disorders start um, around times of change. So like uh, adolescence or early adulthood, um, after experiencing trauma or grief or loss, um, but it's never just one thing that, uh, that causes an eating disorder. So another question that we had pop up was, have I failed as a parent if my child has an eating disorder? Did I do or say something wrong? And the short answer is no, of course not. Um, a parent doesn't cause an eating disorder. There are so many factors at play. And as Caitlin mentioned before, 
um, a lot of risk factors that are identified at a young age and, and in terms of things that people can be exposed to. And these things aren't necessarily in our control. Um, so yeah, being it, a parent doesn't cause an eating disorder. It's, it's not your fault. There's no blame to be associated. Um, and also being a parent or a loved one of someone who has an eating disorder can be extremely overwhelming um, and challenging at times. It can be isolating as well in and of itself. So I think it's really important to know that there are support, there is support for parents and for family members uh, who are supporting loved ones as well. Um, at Cheetah's Place, we offer a family, friends and partner support group. And I know a lot of the participants have felt, um, you know, that having a place where they can speak openly about what they're facing and being able to relate to other people has been really helpful as well as sharing resources and just kind of like skill building and coping mechanisms as well. Um, another organization that I know of, uh, FEAST, the acronym FEAST, F-E-A-S-T, they have an online module for, it's kind of like a one-on-one, a one-on-one uh, for parents uh, who are our parents or loved ones who are helping someone who's coping with an eating disorder, you know that that's a really helpful resource as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, and when it comes to even, you know, the next, the next question that we got actually a few times and worded in different ways was around like identifying an eating disorder, either in a loved one or in oneself, because it, it can actually be harder to identify than some of the other mental health challenges in some ways. So I am going to review just very briefly some of the symptoms of an eating disorder. So if that's going to not be what you need right now, feel free to, to step away for a minute. Um, but essentially, the most common eating disorder symptom is binge eating. And so this would involve, you know, eating a large quantity of food in a short-ish amount of time and really feeling a loss of control while that's happening. Um, so that's the most common symptom. Um, purging is another type of symptom. So an attempt to compensate for binge eating through various means that could be through um, self-induced vomiting or diuretic or laxative use, excessive exercise or fasting, uh, insulin misuse as well. Uh, and then restriction is the third kind of main category. So essentially reducing significantly the quantity of what you're eating or the different types of foods. Um, so all of those things kind of combine to create different diagnoses, which we will not go over. Um, those are the main symptoms. Now, other like signs or ways that you might be able to identify in yourself or in someone else, uh, if there is a problem, uh, would be like an intense preoccupation with weight, with body image, with food, um, really rigid, you know, dietary uh, routines or rules or exercise regimens uh, and not really having a lot of flexibility with that. Um, some physical signs could also include weight loss or weight gain, but that's certainly not, uh, not the best way to tell since most people's weight doesn't really change um, in a way that's noticeable, especially. Um, digestive issues. I noticed someone wrote in the comments here around like IBS or digestive issues being misdiagnosed, often the two are very correlated. So someone, there's actually a very high correlation between restrictive eating disorders and things like Crohn's, IBS, uh, other digestive issues. And it can be a little bit of like a chicken or the egg situation and that it's hard to know what comes first, but um, there's a lot of, of relationship there. Um, changes in sleep, concentrating, fatigue. So really every system of the body can be impacted. And so symptoms or signs can show up in many different ways. Um, people may also feel like they're engaging in like body checking. So like looking in the mirror a lot or feeling different parts of their bodies um, in almost like a compulsive way. Um, and, you know, it looks so different for everyone. So often it's important to, to ask someone if you're worried about someone else to, to kind of ask them about what's going on for them, obviously in a sensitive way, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, and, you know, to know that a lot of these things are, are quite hard to recognize because so many disordered eating symptoms are very normalized in our society. So it can be really hard to know when like a person's exercise regimen goes from being helpful and healthy to unhelpful and, and unhealthy. Um, I find that often when it, you know, when it starts getting in the way of other parts of our life, like if we're canceling plans or not doing other things just so that we can eat and exercise in a certain way, 
that's a sign that there might be um, might be a problem there. Um, so yeah, that's that's something to keep in mind when it comes to weight as well. I'll just circle back to that really quickly. Uh, less than six percent of people with an eating disorder are medically underweight. So weight is not a good way to tell if someone has an eating disorder and if so, which one. So just something to keep in mind there. Absolutely. And I know you had mentioned kind of the ways to approach um, trying to figure out if someone has an eating disorder and that kind of ties in nicely with the next question, which is um, what are some ways to support someone in recovery? And I think you know, the number one thing that you can do to support someone is to actively listen to them. You know, sometimes people need an outlet. They don't necessarily need action-based advice, um, or at least not right away. Sometimes people just need to be heard. And I think it's really important to show them that support by listening. And if they do want a bit more support in terms of actually receiving help, you know, ask them, how can you support them? Everyone is different in their approach. Everyone is different in what they're going to need at the time. So it's really important to ask that person what they need at the time. Um, you know, also be there to provide support and not necessarily focus on their eating disorder. You know, if, if it's a friend or a family or a loved one, you know, engage in activities that you normally would with them. Um, you know, talk to them about issues outside of their eating disorder. Um, think of other ways to help them cope and make them not feel isolated or alone. Because I think that sometimes that's also um, a risk factor in, in symptoms getting worse as well and developing symptoms. Um, something else is to just really have patience. You know, there, there can be a lot of guilt and shame associated with eating disorders. So it's really important to remain patient with that specific person. Um, and also, some of the functions that EDs serve might actually um, put a person in a position where uh, they're in denial or they are refusing to um, accept help or re refusing attempts at support. So um, it's really important to be patient with that person. Also, come at it from a place of compassion. Um, you know, validate that person's feelings, validate their emotions and their thoughts. Um, because there's usually something underlying um, the symptoms. So if you can really like help them cope by validating them, it's, that's also a really key factor and a really important thing to do. Um, another thing too is that it's really important that we reflect on our own um, beliefs and biases about bodies and about body image and about food and kind of notice how you speak about food and bodies with other people because sometimes that can be harmful or detrimental um, and we need to be mindful of the way that we approach these topics with people. Um, and then lastly, we really can't force anyone to change. Um, so you need to be mindful of that, like that motivation to change and to seek help has to come from within a person. So the only thing we can do is support that person until they come to the decision that they want to make that change or that they need support and that they're ready for that kind of thing. Um, and that also kind of ties in with the next question, which is what are some things not to say to someone who has an eating disorder? And there are so many things, and I think that there are uh, like a lot of very common things that occur in conversations and so I think it's really important to kind of go over those things. Um, so commenting on food choices and weight and body, this is something that applies not only to people who have eating disorders, but also applies to anyone. I think it can be damaging for everyone, um, everyone's sense of self and, and their body image and their self-esteem. I think like avoiding commenting on those things as well. Um, you know, these these topics contribute to diet culture, which is already extremely prevalent, as, social, as um, Caitlin mentioned, in social media and just kind of in culture in general. Um, so things like anti-fat sigma, beauty standards, cultural and racial oppression, and ableism, those can all contribute to a person's sense of self. And so bringing those topics up and, and talking about them in, in, in a way that's not constructive can be really harmful. Um, direct comments about weight and size and food consumption can be potentially triggering for a person in the moment and can also be very damaging to their mental health and their sense of self-worth. 
Also, um, it's really important not to assume what a person's symptoms are based on aspects of their identity. Um, so like anything from body image to gender, those things, um, they, they look diff it looks different in everyone. So it's really important not to assume what a person's symptoms are based on those factors. Um, another really big thing that um, comes up uh, in general is labeling food as good versus bad. This is something that we see often, and it's something that's really harmful and really detrimental. So it's really important that we don't moralize food choices, since the type of food we eat doesn't dictate who we are as people. Um, food choices aren't black and white, and it can really feed into harmful diet culture and reinforces certain ED behaviors and symptoms as well. When people are told what they should and shouldn't be eating, I think that it's not helpful, um, and it's directly harmful as well. Um, it also contributes to causing guilt and shame when we associate certain foods as good versus bad, and especially when a person is eating certain things and feels like there is a label associated with them, it can make them feel very guilty. Um, so it's important that we stay away from that kind of um, conversation and that kind of labeling. It's just really not helpful. Um, also, when we label foods as good or bad, it it generally um, ignores a lot of cultures and it doesn't account for socioeconomic status as well. Um, and let's face it, good foods, as we label them traditionally, are generally more expensive. And so they're more inaccessible. So it's really not helpful to label a food as good or bad. Yeah, definitely. That's one that like is so uh, automatic a lot of the time, like in just daily like, oh, I shouldn't be eating this so bad or like, oh, this is my guilty pleasure. Like all of those are like so tied to that. Um, before I answer the next question, I just want to touch on something that someone said in the comments here around, you know, what the pros and cons of asking someone what they need or how you can support them in that, like maybe what they, because if they're, if they're really in their eating disorder, they might be you know, asking for things that would reinforce their eating disorder. So I think this is such an interesting point, you know, this like uh, balance between wanting to respect someone's autonomy and their self-determination, mm -hmm. especially for adults, um, people of all ages as well. Uh, and then also like wanting to protect them and support them in achieving, you know, better health and doing what's best for them. So I don't really have an answer to that question, but I think it's a really important um, balance, especially if we're talking about eating disorders or addiction or, you know, things that really can alter how the brain is thinking about food and, um, and substances. So I, just, I think that's a really great point. So thank you for raising that. Um, the next question we got kind of, it's a really good question. It almost stumped um, Steve and I, um, but really like how to support someone who is unaware that they might be engaging in disordered eating behavior, but they perceive it as healthy. So what, what to do when someone we know uh, is engaging in these behaviors? And I think um, that like that, again, is so common because this line between healthy eating and uh, disordered eating can be so blurred with something, something like substance use. Sometimes the line can be a little bit more clear, not always, but it, it can be. Um, whereas with food and exercise, it can be so blurry. So I mean, if, if this is a person who you are comfortable with and if you feel equipped to do so, providing education about things like health at every size, intuitive eating, um, the risks of dieting, um, and how a lot of like wellness trends are really diets in disguise and they, you know, they can be very harmful to health. We also know dieting for weight loss usually doesn't work and again, can be quite harmful. So if you're open to having those discussions with people who are, are going through that, that's an option. Um, it's hard and people generally like, don't like being called out. And so if there are ways to invite people into the conversation, um, that's always a good strategy. Asking questions or like, oh, I, I, you know, I noticed you're, you're on this diet or eating in this way. Like, can you tell me more about like why you're doing that? Or like, what are you hoping to gain? And often we'll see that, you know, it's not always about food or about health or about 
body image even like often it's there are a lot of other functions that food can play in our lives um whether it's about you know feeling a sense of like self-esteem maintaining control coping with negative or difficult emotions so i think trying to get to those underlying um you know functions or causes is ultimately more productive than focusing on the food so i hope that answer <laughs> kind of helped uh, whoever asked um but it's definitely a really good question with, with not one answer. Absolutely. Um, I think that that covers the bulk of like the questions about eating disorders at large. Um, I hope that all of this has been helpful and that if anyone did ask a question that we did kind of clarify and answer that question properly. Um, also, again, feel free to continue asking questions in the comments. We're definitely looking at them and can address them as we go along. Um, so we had some more questions more related to sort of support in general, and then like Sheena's place support and what we offer. Uh, so I think that I'll go into that a little bit now. Um, so one of them, it was a really good question. Do you offer programs for people who experience body image issues? And yes, we do. Body image is one of our five categories of groups. Um, so you, you can, we, we do have offer groups that center around body image. Um, although just to point out, it often is a topic that comes up in our general support groups as well. I think it's something that, um, obviously it's something that touches on that, that is, um, an issue that is faced in anyone, especially anyone facing an eating disorder. So I think that that's kind of a generally um, common topic that comes up in a lot of those groups. But more specifically, we do have body image groups um, in the past and in the present. We've had like workshops and webinars as well as groups that center on fostering a, a healthy and holistic relationship with body image and kind of aims to cultivate a more inclusive space for folks to feel represented and also to feel free from weight stigma. And I think that that's really important when we're doing work that is associated with, um, um, that is really closely tied to body image. It's really important that people feel represented and feel safe in these spaces. Um, so the next question is, how do you actually access our, our groups at Sheena's Place? And this one, it, if you um, are looking to access our groups right away, I, I think that this would be really helpful. Um, you can just go to our website and our website has pretty clear um, guidelines about how it is, how you do access groups. But um, just to clear up some of those questions, so right now, our drop-in support groups are the only ones that are immediately available. Um, we're kind of entering the end of our current season, the winter season. And so a lot of our groups are, are full, but our spring season is starting very shortly. And um, the program calendar for the spring season is coming out next week. And then groups uh, registration for those groups is going to start on March 15th at 10 a.m. So I think a really important thing to do if you do, or if you are thinking of registering for our groups is to um, make an account with us online, like as soon as possible um, this weekend or whenever you can. Um, that way you get email updates about anything coming up. So you'll get an update about when the next registration meets are. We tend to send out um, that reminders about when registration is just so that people are aware because obviously right now especially during COVID uh, things kind of feel a little bit crazy and we understand that so it's important to have that information in a centralized location um but yeah so it's pretty simple just head to our website um on the top right hand corner there's a little button that says register you click that and it's gonna send you to the platform that we use to register I see a couple of questions here about specific groups. Um, the first is about bari the bariatric group. So this is something we offered in the fall. Um, we also have offered a webinar on the topic. It's of course not a support group, but it is available on our YouTube channel for anyone interested in watching. Um, there is a really high correlation between you know, bariatric surgery patients and uh, eating disorders. Um, 
I will say, so we, we were going to offer the group again in the spring. Um, there have been a few hiccups and we won't be offering it this spring, um, but we do hope to bring it back in the future. Um, so please stay tuned. I apologize for any disappointment. Um, but know that folks, of course, um, are welcome to join any of the groups, um, but unfortunately that specific one won't be available. Uh, in terms of trauma therapy, we have found in the past, we have offered some programs specific to uh, eating disorders and trauma, because again, that's a really um, like two very highly correlated um, things. Uh, online, we're finding that it's a little bit harder to offer those types of things specific to trauma. Uh, and so while all of our groups are trauma informed, at the moment, we don't have specific programs um, related to processing trauma. Um, so just to clear that up, feel free to ask any follow up questions um, about that. Um, and yeah, in terms of other, I guess, Steve, we can speak to some like other supports if Sheena's Place, you know, Sheena's Place isn't for everyone. We're also only open to people in Ontario who are 17 and older. So if you don't fall into that, into either of those categories, um, we can provide some information about alternative resources. Absolutely. Um, the first resource that I'm going to mention is NEDIC, the National Eating Disorder Information Center. Um, they are a really great organization that uh, provides information as well as referrals to organizations and um, practitioners across Canada that uh, mental health practitioners across Canada that uh, are eating disorder informed. So they're a really good resource and a good starting point for folks to kind of find the the first supports that they need um, at the time. So you can head to their website, netic.ca. They have a toll-free helpline as well. Um, they, yeah, so you can give them a call, just kind of let them know what it is you're looking for and they can try to help you access those services. Um, in terms of treatment, there is Body Brave. They're an organization based in Hamilton. They offer group support as um, uh, just as we do. Um, but they also offer intake and one-on-one -on -one treatment based on need. Um, so that's a really great resource to go to if you're looking for treatment. Um, I know that often, um, I'm going to mention also hospital programs, but I know that there are often a lot of wait times. So I think that it's good to have more information about uh, other services that you can access as well. So Body Rave is a really good one. Um, in terms of hospital programs, there are quite a few in Ontario. If you go to um, ocoped.ca, you can see a full list of the Ontario Hospital Eating Disorder Programs. Um, so support across Canada, there's Eating Disorders Nova Scotia and uh, Looking Glass BC. They offer peer support, group, peer group support. And I'm pretty sure that Eating Disorders Nova Scotia has also support a chat support as well. Um, there's Silver Linings and uh, EDSNA, the Eating Disorder Support Network of Alberta. They, um, they offer group support as well. I know that there is a cost associated, but they do have financial assistance for anyone that needs it as well, and it's, it's very accessible. So they're two really good organizations that you can look out for. Um, then there's also some uh, demographic-specific orgs. Um, I, I really wish that there were, and I hope for the future that there will be more um, located in Canada. But for now, the ones that we know of are uh, fed up. So they're fighting eating disorders in underrepresented populations, a trans and intersex collective. And then there's Nalgona Positivity Pride. So they, they offer awareness and body liberation. liberation. Uh, they offer lectures, webinars, and they also offer group support. And they've had really um, good webinars that I've seen over the last little while that have offered a lot of information on various topics um, specific to certain demographics. So they're a really great one to check out. Um, and then another thing that I wanted to bring up too about uh, speaking about demographics specific supports is that uh, at Sheena's Place, we do offer a few demographic specific support groups. So we have our BIPOC support group. Um, we have our trans non-binary and gender questioning support group. And we also have our disabled and chronically ill support group. So if um, you identify in any of those, um, um, those specific demographics, we do have groups that cater specifically to that. And we're also hoping to introduce more groups 
um, of that variety, as well as um, just more specific groups in the future as well. Yeah, so I we are coming towards the end of our time, but we are happy to answer um, any more questions anyone has. Um, so if there is anything else you want to know about eating disorders or about Sheena's place, feel free to write that um, in the comments. I'm so used to Zoom. I keep wanting to say write it in the chat, but that's <laughs> that's not what it's called. I guess something we didn't mention is all of our groups are running online right now. So we typically are operating out of like a really kind of warm and cozy home environment um, at Bloor and Spadina. However, of course, we're not able to do that right now. So we hope um, once it's safe to do so, we hope to offer both online and in-person groups going forward because we know online has been so critical to so many people for accessibility reasons. So uh, it's definitely something we'll continue. Absolutely. All right. Well, I don't see any more questions coming in, so I guess we um, can wrap it up for today. Um, but know that you can always reach out to us. Um, the best way to reach out is by calling us or emailing info at sheenasplace.org for any information at all. Um, we also have an information session coming up next week. Um, so if you uh, visit us on social media or give us a call, uh, we can provide you with more information about that info session. Awesome. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in.